Today, as we come to the table. Now you're believers, you're not, but though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart the form of doctrine to which you were delivered. So we were slaves. Those of you that now are free have given your life to Jesus and you're walking in that freedom. And having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. We were serving one master and now we're serving another. Again, the old Bob Dylan song, you have to serve somebody, right? And so again, Bob Dylan wrote that song in light of the scripture and what it said, believe it or not, many people don't know that. But he wrote that in light of the fact that the Bible says we all serve someone. You're either going to serve God or you're going to serve the enemy. might say, wait a minute, I may not be a Christian, but I'm not a Satanist either. The hard truth is, if you haven't accepted Jesus as your Savior and submitted to Him, you're serving yourself and chained to sin. Whether you're aware of it or not, in your disobedience, you're serving the enemy of God. Well, thanks for taking the time to join us as we come to the table, the daily Bible study program of Mark Kirk, Senior Pastor of Calvary Knoxville. The incredible news of the gospel is that you don't have to stay in that slavery. When Christ opens your eyes to your need for him, you'll find that he requires nothing of you but faith. In today's message, Pastor Mark will encourage you to make that decision and find the peace and assurance that Christ will give. Now, let's join Pastor Mark in the book of Galatians chapter 4 as he begins his message, A Child of Slavery or A Child of Freedom. Let's open our Bibles to Galatians chapter 4. Looking at a child of slavery or a child of freedom, let's read verses 17 to 20, uh, and then we'll kind of give a background and, and lay the, the foundation before we jump into this. Notice it says here in verse 17 of chapter 4 in Galatians, they zealously court you, but for no good. Yes, they want to exclude you that they may be zealous for them. But it is good to be zealous in a good thing always, and not only when I am present with you. My little children, for whom I labor in birth again until Christ is formed in you, I would like to be present with you now and to change my tone, for I have doubts about you. Now, Paul, again, has been dealing with them in some very serious ways, some very firm ways. As a matter of fact, we're going to see today, Paul uh, begins to kind of change his tone somewhat because he knows he's been very firm with them in the first part of this letter. And Paul's going to now kind of balance some of that out with that pastor's heart, knowing he had to be firm because they were going the wrong direction. He needed to deal with, deal with it in a serious enough way that it would get their attention. But he's going to now move more into, again, not finishing up kind of that dealing with the issues, but practical issues in chapters 5 and 6 when we get there. And, and But what Paul is going to start now, really in a two-week session we're going to be doing here, because it's going to take us a couple of weeks to get through this topic, although we'll work our way to the end of the Bible by the end of next week. I mean, the end of this chapter, not the Bible. Uh, yeah, hang on, it's going to be a long sermon next week, I promise. Now, the end of this chapter, by the end of next week, only covering up through 20, but then 21 through 31 next week, and looking at, as I said, the theme being, this being part one, a child of slavery or a child of freedom. You know, everyone on the planet falls into one or two categories. We are either a child of slavery or we are a child of the Spirit. And what do I mean by that? The Bible says that we're all born in sin, and as a result, we are slaves to sin. Now, if you're visiting today and you don't know the Lord, that might seem offensive to you. You know, hey, you don't know me. You're telling me I'm a slave to sin. Well, listen, here's what the Bible says. The Bible says if you don't know the Lord, all of us are slaves to sin until we're set free by Christ. The problem is we often don't realize it. And, and, and this is what Paul's going to be saying to them. You're putting yourself back under slavery after you've been set free. But all of us were meant to be free in Christ, except we are enslaved to sin. That is, we can't stop sinning. We can't live righteously without God. And it, Paul points this out in Romans chapter 6, verses 17 through 18, where it says this, but God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, notice that prior to Jesus, all of us were slaves of sin, though you were. Now you're believers, you're not. But though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart 
the form of doctrine to which you were delivered. So we were slaves. Those of you that now are free have given your life to Jesus and you're walking in that freedom. And having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. We were serving one master and now we're serving another. Again, the old Bob Dylan song, you have to serve somebody, right? And so again, Bob Dylan wrote that song in light of the scripture and what it said, believe it or not, many people don't know that. But he wrote that in light of the fact that the Bible says we all serve someone. You're either going to serve God or you're going to serve the enemy. And you might say, well, I don't know the Lord, but I certainly don't serve the enemy. It says in John, 1 John rather, that the wicked one, that is speaking of Satan, has sway, note this, over the entire world. And what that means is the world is under the sway of the wicked one, under the influence of Satan, whether they realize it or not. Now, you may not be walking around killing people, raping people, doing what we would call evil things, but the realization is it is Satan that controls everyone that is not under the control of Jesus Christ. And the only way to be set free from that is through Jesus Christ. So how are we free? In the Lord. How we do it? Through the cross. He defeated sin and death. And set all who believe in him free on the cross. Now, when does this happen? Because again, there may be some here today that don't know the Lord. I don't know everyone in here knows the Lord. Maybe some of you have just been religious. Maybe some of you are visiting. I know many of you, but the bottom line is, is that how do we get set free and how do we know we're set free? Well, you'll know it when it happens. And that is the Bible calls it being born again. We talk about being born a second time. It's not just a religious term. I remember growing up as a small kid thinking being born again was just another religious term, and that was what that group called it, but our group had the same thing. It's just our group didn't say born again. Our group just said whatever, right? You know, we, just, we go to church and we're religious or whatever, and it wasn't until I was born again, until that event happened in my life that I realized this is not a religious terminology. This is an event that takes place, and if you have not had the event of being born again take place in your life, the Bible says you cannot go to heaven. You will not enter the kingdom of God. It's not God being harsh. It's not God being mean. It's a requirement to enter into the righteous kingdom. The good news is, and that's where we get the word gospel. Gospel means good news. The good news is when you give your life to Jesus Christ, all your sins are washed away. You are born again, and now you are in the kingdom of God. And so it's something that can be lost in terminology, but it's something we need to realize. It's an actual event. Again, the first time we are born, it is a natural event. That is in these bodies that we now inhabit. Uh, we don't remember that. We were too young to remember, but trust me, our mom remembers. Uh, and, and, you know, our dad will remember, but mom really remembers when that happened. It was an actual event that mom can say, this event happened. I was a major part of it. I saw it take place. But even as that is a major event that's real, the second birth is a major event that is just as real, except this time it is a supernatural birth from heaven that is done by the Spirit of God. God does it. And if you're sitting here right now saying, well, I, I think I've done that, but I'm not sure. Listen, when it happens, you will know it. You're not going to be sitting here going, I don't know if I'm born again or not. When it happens, you will know you're born again. Because here's the bottom line. You don't suddenly become some saint that floats from place to place. But you realize there is a weight off of my back. Something has changed in my heart. I feel something has changed radically in my life. For the first time, the Bible begins to make sense. And it's not just a Bible, it's a letter written to you. You begin to associate and understand other believers and, and their lives and their relationship to God. It's a whole change of life. And it truly is radical. When they say born again, it is a radical thing that takes place. And it is the evidence that you are now a child of God and about to enter the kingdom. And if you don't have that evidence or that radical thing has not taken place in your life, you need to do that today. Listen, you need to settle this issue before you walk out of here. Because the Bible says it's the only way you're going to have the, the inheritance in the kingdom of God. Jesus addressed it famously with Nicodemus in John chapter 3, verse 3, where, where Jesus said this. He said, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot. Just meditate on that word a minute. He cannot see the kingdom of God. Why? Because flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God and sin must be taken out of the way before we can get into the kingdom of God. And this can only be done by a spiritual means, 
And when it happens, we're set free from the slavery to sin and to the judgment of sin, and now we're free to follow the Lord. So it's a, it's a freedom that comes. It's not just the fact that you're going to get into, uh, you know, be free from your sin, but it gives you your keys into heaven. It's what does it. However, and this is the thing that's very interesting to me because I was trapped in this. The insidious thing, and that just means the really bad thing about this, about sin in our lives and being enslaved to sin is most of us don't even know that we are enslaved until we're set free. Personal testimony. I went to church growing up. I thought that I knew Jesus Christ. I thought that I knew God. I thought that I was going to heaven. But all of a sudden, my wife and others began to share with me, you know what? I, you know, you, you really need to give your life to Jesus. This is what it means to be a Christian. And I eventually gave my life to the Lord. And when I was born again, it was my eyes were opened. Suddenly I realized the Bible was true. It literally is the word of God. Suddenly I understood it. Suddenly I realized I was forgiven of my sins. Everything changed. It was very radical. But what's amazing about that is if you had asked me before that event happened, Mark, are you saved and going to heaven? I would have said absolutely yes, but I wouldn't have. I was deceived. I believed I was going to heaven because I grew up in church. I grew up around other Christians and in the South or whatever, but I had never made that personal commitment to Jesus Christ. I had never asked forgiveness of my sins heart to heart with the Lord. I'd never really turned away, and that born-again experience had never happened to me. But when it happened, I knew it. And as I said, it was shocking to me because after I realized, you know what? I thought that I was going to heaven. I realized what a shock it would have been. If I had died thinking I was going to heaven and suddenly stand before the Lord of all glory and he goes, I don't know who you are. Now, certainly he knows me, he created everyone. But he would say, you're not a part of my family. What? I I grew up in church. I did all the right things. What do you mean? No, you never did repent of your sin. You didn't turn from it. You didn't believe in me on a personal level on the cross. You didn't ask me to forgive you. You didn't choose to follow me. Mark, you were never born again. And, And the realization now that I am born again When I think about the fact that I thought I was, but I wasn't, and that I would stand before God, I just go, it makes me just burst into almost spontaneous praise going, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Because I would have not known. I would have stood before you and been judged and been separated. The Bible says when the Lord comes back in the second coming, he's going to separate the sheep from the goats, the sheep being the believers, the goats representing the unbelievers. And he's going to say to the, to the, to the sheep, he's going to say, enter into the joy of the Lord, the kingdom that's prepared before you. But he's going to say to the goats, the unbeliever, depart from me, I never knew you. And the realization of that fear of that hit me when I came to the realization of the truth. And my plea in my heart to you today is that you realize what God has for you if you'll simply receive Jesus Christ. The Bible says God desires that none perish. He wants you to be in the kingdom, but don't be deceived in thinking you're going if you've not been born again. You must be born again, as God said to Nicodemus. Now, it's interesting. When we stand there before the Lord on judgment day, for us, we don't have to worry about that. I mean, we don't have to worry about judgment. Here's what's really awesome about this. Here's the thing. For those who don't know the Lord, the Bible says they'll be judged by the Bible whether they believe it or not. You see, there are two groups of people, the slave of of freedom and God and the slave of sin and death. And so there's gonna be a judgment based on that. And we might say, yeah, but somebody might say, well, I don't believe the Bible. That's not gonna matter. You know, there's an old saying, ignorance of the law is what? It's no excuse, right? Where do you think that mindset comes from? That mindset comes from the the scriptural foundation of whether or not you believe the truth or not, the truth is the truth and you're going to be judged based on it. You know, it's interesting when you have something happen legally in court and you maybe go from one state to the next and you go in that state and maybe the laws are different there, you might get a ticket for something you did that maybe you wouldn't get a ticket for here. And the bottom line is you can stand before the judge and say, yeah, but in Tennessee, this isn't against the law. He said, well, we're not in Tennessee. This is the law, but I didn't know that law. Well, I'm sorry you didn't know that law, but whether you know it or not, here's the law, and you got caught doing it, so now you have the consequence. You see, the same thing is true when we're going to stand before God. Whether you believe the Bible or not, whether people believe the Bible or not, God says he's going to base everyone on two things. Whether or not you've given your heart to Jesus Christ, which means everything's been fulfilled because the Bible says Jesus fulfilled, remember, the legal side of the law on the cross, But at the same time, if you don't have that legality fulfilled for you on the cross, now the Bible says you're going to be under the law whether you believe it or not. And so I imagine people standing there before the Lord, they're going to be shocked 
They're going to say, why, why didn't this happen? Again, I'm not saying that God didn't give them an opportunity, but when the reality hits of what they're going to be facing, for us, it's going to be, you know what? Enter into the joy of the Lord. As a dad, and as a mom, but I can associate with a mom, there's, there's sweet things you get to do when your kids are little. You can do it when they're bigger too, but especially when they're little, and they get so excited, you have special surprises for them. And so you might bring them a special surprise, and you hold it behind your back, and you say, all right, I've got to like, oh, yeah, what is it? You know, like, let me see, let me see, let me see what it is. Okay, I'm going to show you, right? I'm going to show you. And you give it to them, and they're like, yes, I love this. And they're all excited, and they're running around the house excited, right? That's what your day is going to be like on Judgment Day. When you stand before the Lord, it's going to be, listen, the Bible says, Jesus said to his disciples, if you being evil, that is of the sin nature, he wasn't name calling, he was saying of the sin nature, if you being evil know how to give good gifts to your kids, how much more the heavenly father. And I think about standing before him now, knowing him. And seeing him welcoming us as, as, he, as he comes to get us in the rapture of the church and the wedding supper of the Lamb, getting ready to give us our rewards and to show us the kingdom and just saying, are you ready? Are you, yes, are you ready? This is yours. <gasps> wow. It's going to be a lot better than door number one. I guarantee you that. <laughs> it's really mine. It's yours. I mean, I'm not just kind of like, you know, invited in and can be a part of it. No, it's yours. It is the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. It's yours forever. And there's going to be such joy and such excitement. But what a contrast to those who don't receive Jesus Christ as Lord. It says he's going to turn to them and say, depart from me. I never knew you. And you think, wow, that seems awfully harsh. That seems awfully strong. It's not that God desires that. God doesn't want, the Bible says again, he wants none to perish. He wants everyone in the kingdom. But he, he makes the offer. Here's the thing. He doesn't make you receive the offer. He gives you the opportunity to say, no, I don't want that. And that is why we make the appeal. That is why I make the appeal to you today. If you've not been born again, there's such great surprises waiting for you forever in the kingdom of God, such glory, such forgiveness. But if you don't, there's going to be such shock and such horror at the reality of I was given an opportunity there in November 2019 at Calvary Chapel in Knoxville, and I didn't make that decision. But it's so important that we do it. And again, when I think about most people not realizing that they're slaves to sin, if you ask the normal person, or whatever that is, are you a slave to sin, right? What, what, if, what, are you a slave to sin? Most people will say, well, no, I do what I want. I run my own life. And, and this is what makes, again, sin so wicked because it blinds us and we don't even realize that we're a slave to it. Listen, if you don't think you're a slave to sin, try to live righteously. Try to live the way the Bible says you're supposed to live. You'll find out in one day, that your slaves said, no, I'm not. I just like to do it. Okay, I hear the pride. I used to be that way. Give it time. And then when you humble yourself and realize that, no, you really can't stop, then you'll recognize, I am enslaved to this. And the only one that can set you free and get you into heaven is the Lord. We think we're running our own lives, but we're not because we're all under the sway of the wicked when the Bible says the only ones that are free are those under Christ. Now we've been set free, and so now we can live for the Lord um, and be free in that. I think this is one of the main reasons many people don't respond to the gospel because they don't even know they have a need. If you tell some people today, hey, do you, do you, have you been saved? I remember when I heard that growing up, my first thought was, is saved from what? What do you mean saved? I'm fine. No floods, no emergencies, no car wrecks. But I guess I don't need to be saved. But what you don't understand is, no, have you been saved from your sin? Have you been saved from coming judgment? Because everybody's going to stand before God and face that one day. And so many people don't even know that they're going to stand before God and face that judgment. Therefore, they don't know that they need to be saved. And I think oftentimes we need to be able to let people know that you have a need. They need to understand that, yes, your life is not pleasing to God. You need to be rescued from that life if you want to go to heaven. Again, I refer to bumper sticker theology, which, by the way, I don't recommend. But you'll see these bumper stickers ever so often, right? And one that I've used with you guys before, but this just really sums it up. You'll see that born okay the first time. We weren't. We weren't. The problem is the Bible says, no, you weren't born. We, we were born horribly flawed and with sin running through our veins, unable to get to heaven. And unless something happens to change that by being born again in the spirit, we're not going to get to go to heaven. And so this is why Paul is going to make this very point today, reminding the Galatians they're either going to live as children of God through what Jesus has done 
or be lost eternally as slaves to their sin by trusting in the law. And so what is the setting here? Remember, Paul's in the middle of his argument. He's used the argument about, you know, hey, you're a child of God right now. One day you're going to be a full heir, but that's like that picture of the law holding you back until you're free. You shouldn't let the law hold you back. You're free now. You're in Christ. And then again, he, he confronts them and rebukes them in uh, verse 10 saying, I'm worried about you. You observe days, you observe months, you observe seasons, you observe years. That is, you're trying to follow the law. And he's saying, I poured all in, this into you. And, and we, we ended last week with Paul saying, and because I'm confronting you in this on love, and again, Paul a little bit firm because of his passion and his heart for them, now I'm your enemy? Have I become your enemy because I tell you the truth? See, that's the thing. Every pastor needs to be able to say what the Bible says clearly. And sometimes it may offend your heart. You may hear something I say and say, who? I can't believe he said that. You know? Here's the question. Are you mad at, at me or are you mad at the truth that was revealed in your heart when this was read? Now, if I'm being rude and ugly and, you know, trying to say that it's, you know, I'm, I'm representing God and I'm yelling at you and whatever, and it's just me, that's one thing. But if I'm simply sharing the word of God and your heart's convicted, that's the Holy Spirit of God, see? And Paul said, guys, all I've done is share the word of God plainly and clearly with you, and now I'm your enemy? That's where he ended last week. And he goes on in verse 17 and says, speaking about these Judaizers, which means those people that were coming in the church trying to make them follow the law, he said, look, they zealously court you. They use a lot of energy, but for no good. Yes, they want to exclude you, that you may be zealous for them. Now, look how wise the enemy is in deceiving within the church. And I've seen this as well. These false teachers actively and aggressively go after you, but not for your good, but rather for their good, which ultimately is bad. They want you to be a part of their group rather than simply a part of the kingdom of God. And they don't seek you out to encourage you to follow the Lord. They seek you out to encourage you to follow them or follow their group or follow their movement. Listen, our job is not to, you know, to try to get everybody, you know, to come to Calvary Chapel. Our job is to try to get everybody in the kingdom of God. And wherever God settles them, that's where God wants them to be. We're simply working along with the Lord. Now, there are obvious cults like the Mormons and the Jehovah's Witness who go door to door. Uh, many of these people never make any effort really uh, among the lost, so to speak. They're not trying to convert anybody because they themselves aren't converted. What they're trying to do is get you to follow their group. You know, they have the, well, the, the Mormons go on their little uh, two-year thing where they go around or whatever and ride their bikes everywhere, and the Joe's Witness do the same thing. And what Paul is saying is people like this, and again, this is, he was comparing them. They didn't have Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses in this day, but he's saying the Judaizers, are, they're like our modern-day Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses or those that are legalists within the church. And he said, they're zealous. I mean, you got to admit, these guys are very zealous in what they do, are they not? How many of us are going to get out, you know, every Saturday knocking on doors or ride our bicycle everywhere to go and try to share the gospel? I mean, again, the zealousness that they put forth oftentimes can put the church to shame in what we do as far as outreach. But the bottom line is, is they're not evangelizing to truly get people in the kingdom of God. They're trying to get people to follow their group, again, which is a common trait among a false teacher. They preach to those who are already saved. That's another thing. They're, they go and they try to get the believer to follow their group, if you will. I remember hearing about a, a crusade they were having out in California a while back, and the Mormons will go to the parking lot of the crusade, and when the new believers come out carrying all their materials that they get from, from the, you know, the Harvest Crusade or from some outreach, they'll be standing there waiting to talk and say, look, now that you've made this commitment, let us show you the true way. And they try to pull them away. And so, again, people out there running them out of the parking lot, so to speak, but the bottom line is you can't get rid of all of them. And Paul says, while I want the best for you to see that you're walking with God, they are trying to exclude you from heaven by getting you to leave what Jesus did on the cross and to follow them and their religion, doing all their good works, doing the things they want you to do. And when he speaks of excluding them, this is emphasized in the language, and it means to shut you out. Thanks for coming to the table of God's Word with Pastor Mark for his study in Galatians. No matter what century you live in, there will be disagreements in the church. For the church in Galatia, they were experiencing it firsthand, as there were differences of opinion about how things should be. Situations in churches can get sticky, so it's important to cling to what God's Word says about the topic. Galatians reminds you that people want to get it right, but sometimes they need a little correction or direction. We hope as you've listened today, you've gained some direction in your life as well. Thanks for tuning in, and we'd like to invite you to come visit us. If you're in the Knoxville area, we'd love for you to come to Calvary Knoxville this Sunday. Our morning services are at 8, 9.30, and 11.15. 
We also have a Sunday night Bible study that meets at 6 and a midweek service every Wednesday night at 7. And we'd love for you to bring your whole family. Every time we gather is an opportunity for you to grow in what you're learning and experiencing with God. If you're interested or would like more info, click on the church link at the bottom of the page at thewaymedia.net. And if you want to listen to any of these studies again, just click on the Come to the Table link at thewaymedia.net or connect with the Way Media app. Well, we're out of time for today, but we'll continue our verse-by-verse study through Galatians the next time we come to the table. Come to the Table is a radio outreach ministry of Calvary Knoxville.